like when my kids were little, could you get them to put up the bumpers and nobody judged you because you had kids with you? Because I can't pull, I can't do anything athletic at all. So I can put up bumpers and act like it's for kids. <laughs> well, now that my kids are bigger than me, they don't believe that anymore. <laughs> we're going to talk about God's divine design this evening. Um, me and Jesus were just talking about some stuff about a month or so ago, and, and he kind of started... I was complaining about a certain circumstance that I was in, because that's what, what I do when I get frustrated. I just go to Jesus and pray about him. And at, and at one point in our talk, he just kind of imparted the words, what if it's my divine design? What if it has nothing to do with you? What if what you're going through is not a bad thing? It is not a hurtful thing, but because it's not what you want, it's not what you expected, and you've been hurt, and your, your circumstances have been... Uh, Upheaved, your schedule, your need for control has been interrupted and you don't like that. So all you're seeing is that. But what if it is a divine design and I'm working something through you for a better purpose? And you're not going to see it because you're too mad that I interrupted your schedule. That it's not a burden. It's not necessarily a, a bad thing. And so um, as he began to kind of say, stop looking at you and start looking at what I'm doing. Start watching me. Start watching the work that's happening. Um, we just began to, to kind of meditate on that. And that was... Um, developing, like I said, about a month ago. So I thought I would bring it to you. Uh, just a friendly reminder that every event in our life, good or bad, is God's divine design in our life. There is no event, there is no circumstance, there is no trial, there is no celebration that God didn't design. He's not surprised by anything that happens. When tomorrow comes and whatever happens tomorrow, he knows it's happening. <laughs> and nothing surprises him. From baptisms to battles, God's design is there. From the moment we get saved, to the moment that we have to fight, you know, to remember we're saved. From baptisms to battles, his design is in place. He made sure that minister was there and healthy and didn't have a sore throat or didn't have a broke foot the day you got saved and had your first altar call. He made sure the, the, the people in your life got you to church the day you got baptized. He made sure every step in this entire world was orchestrated for that one moment that you'll forever hold in your heart, that, that is special to you, the moment that you accepted the call, the moment that you got saved, the moment you got baptized, any of your spiritual um, overcomings, any of your spiritual victories, he made sure everything around you worked just perfectly so that in that moment, in that time, you would have that victory. And in the same way, the battles, the trial, the trial, all of the, the junk and the muck that we get stuck in, he has orchestrated all of that because there is a divine design behind it. We like to walk around as Christians saying Satan's tempting me or Satan's really come against me in my house or Satan's really, you know, launched a full-fledged attack. And I think we we give Satan a little too much credit. <laughs> I think things we blame on Satan are bad decisions on our part. <laughs> I think if we made better decisions, we wouldn't be under attack. I think if we made better life choices, we wouldn't be in the boat that we're in. And I say we because I make a really lot of bad decisions sometimes. I'll make several in a row. And for Christians, it, because we know God loves us and we know God doesn't visit bad things on us. So when bad things happen or, or things that are difficult happen, we have to blame somebody. So we blame Satan. And the truth is, we may have just made a bad choice. It happens. doesn't mean you have to stay there. It doesn't mean you're a terrible or wicked person. It means you made a bad choice and you're human. The problem is we let that bad choice become an obstacle. We let it become a trial, and then we begin to say Satan is against us. Our choices allow or restrict the devil's access to our lives. I can choose to look at my circumstance and say, I'm under attack, it's the devil, and cry and get people to pray for me, or I can say, I didn't eat like I should, and so now I'm fatter than I should be, and so when I fail, I hurt a lot more than I would have if I was healthy, and so me and God are going to get me healthy. I'm going to start doing things that are better so that those things, I can either cry because I fell and hurt myself, or I can say, this is a, a, an opportunity for me and God to get together and get me healthy. The problem is we like to cry when it happens. And we like to say, Satan got me. Satan's out to get me. And he's against me. When the truth is, we, we might have made a bad choice. And we're giving Satan way too much access to our lives. The only strength Satan holds on you is the strength you give him. When Jesus died and he took the, the sin on the cross and he was resurrected and he sits on the right hand of the Father, at that point, Satan was stripped of all power. He cannot hurt you unless you let him. And so it's a choice you make to decide, am I a victor today or am I a victim? Am I going to overcome today or am I, I going to be overcome today? 
It is a choice, and it is a hard choice. I'm not going to pretend sometimes it's not easier just to crawl up in a corner and cry for a little bit. I've done that too. It is okay to have your own to feel your feelings, but you don't stay there. The problem is we want to um, um, pretend like it has nothing to do with us. We're God's child, so Satan's just going to get us. When the truth is, we're making some bad choices and we can do better. And we should strive to do better rather than give Satan a bunch of credit and, and act like a bunch of martyrs when that's not the case at all. But um, God's divine design is there. It is there in the battles. Esther 4.14 said, Perhaps you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. At this point, Malachi has asked her to you know, go to the king, save the Jews, because he's going to kill everybody. And she says, I can't do that. That's against the rules. You weren't allowed to go to the king unless you were summoned. And she was like, I can't do that. And Malachi responds with, Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Maybe you were born to save the Jews in a position where you don't feel like you have the power to do so. Because this is a battle for her. Because if she goes to the king without being called, she could be beheaded. I mean, life is done. She knows this is a serious battle she has to decide. And she gets this wisdom spoken to her. I want to speak that wisdom to you this evening as well because we are in a royal position. We are brothers and sisters with Christ. We are joint heirs to the very throne of God. We get the inheritance of everything that God's kingdom is. And perhaps we are in this royal position for such a time as this, to show people what royalty really looks like. And it's not sock snobbery. It's not exclusion. It's not judgment. It's not condemnation. We need to show them what royalty looks like. It looks like inclusion. It looks like acceptance. It looks like adoption. It looks like freedom. It looks like hope. It looks like family. It looks like people who are there with each other. It looks like somebody who can get in the fight with them, and the very next day they're both just fine because they know they have emotions and they had to sort through it. It looks like hope. But they don't see that. Perhaps we were born and we were put in the world at this exact moment in time because it's time for us to let the world see what royalty looks like. And it doesn't look like what they've been taught. It doesn't look like what I was taught. We, we get this idea that royalty for Christ means we have to be holy and so we don't participate in anything they do. Jesus went and had dinner with tax collectors. He touched the lepers. He congratulated the woman with the issue of blood for touching him. Jesus didn't do anything they call holy. To this day, ministers, and I had ministers tell me, you don't go hang around with sinners because if you lay with dogs, you get up with fleas. People are going to think you're like that. People are going to think you condone that. Well, if I don't go there, those people that are doing it are never going to stop doing it because nobody's giving them hope or love or, or, or acceptance for just who they are. The problem is the church says to be holy, I have to be separate because that's what the scriptures say. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say you are separate from Satan. You are separate from everything God has freed you from. You're not separate from each other. We are one brotherhood. We are one royal priesthood. And we are in a position for such a time as this. We are in a special place in this world of technology where we have Facebook and Twitter and videos and, and, and this ability to connect with each other. The regular mail. I mean, there's so many ways that we can connect with one another that in this time, we are given, each of us individually have been given an opportunity to lead people. Whether it's our neighbors, our co-workers, our children, our parents, <laughs> whoever it is, we are in a position where we can stand up and take a moment to lead people because people are desperate for something to believe in. I think that's why politics gets so riled up right now. I think that's why that's such a hot topic issue. I don't think people are naturally embittered toward one another, but they are so desperate for something to believe in, for something to stand for, that they're going to grab the first thing they're handed. Why don't we hand them something worth fighting over? Why don't we hand them something worth standing with? Why don't we hand them something that makes them love the guy that doesn't believe what they believe? Why don't we say, no matter what you do, this is a solid truth, instead of just, it's only the truth as long as they're in office. <laughs> I mean, people are tired of not knowing what tomorrow holds. And the beautiful thing is, we might not know, but we're okay with it. We're okay with it, because we have a relationship with God that says it doesn't matter what tomorrow looks like. He's going to be there with us. He's got a promise for us. He's got a hope for us, so it doesn't matter what tomorrow holds. And we've got a whole people right now that are... Tomorrow is uncertain. We, they've had COVID and they don't know how that's going to work out. And vaccines and they don't know how that's going to work out. And, the, and, and like I said, the, our political landscape is as crazy and, and, and as much upheaval that it's ever been in. And, and nobody has any assurances. They need those. And we're in a time and a position that we can give it. It's God's design <coughs> that we see that and that we don't leave, lose it because we've lost focus. When we begin to focus on the division, the news media likes to say that racism is a huge problem in this country. They, they like to put on to us that there's a, a divide like never before in this country. 
Just yesterday, I went to Kroger, and I couldn't get around because there was a group of people, like in the middle, you know how you couldn't get around because people are stopping chatting because that's what you do at the grocery store. You meet everybody at the grocery store. And there were two families. One family had a, was biracial. There was a white woman and a black man. They were, they were married. You could tell she had her little arm linked. And they had children that were biracial. And then the people they were talking to, one of them was Latina because I heard him speak in Spanish to the child of them. And, the, and I thought, we are so divided, but I can't get through my hometown Kroger. There's every racial group represented right there in one little group. It's not everywhere. Is there racial divide? Of course. Are there nasty, ugly people? Of course. Is it as predominant as we think when that's all we focus on? And that's not God's design. God's design is to look at it and say, look at the unity. Look at the hope. You can listen to the division and you can be told over and over about everybody that hates everybody or you can focus on what I'm doing. And I'm bringing people together like never before. There was a time in this town biracial was not okay. I mean, I grew up here. There was a time that was not okay. There was a time single motherhood was not okay. There was a time when you were shamed for that. I remember there was a time. Now we're not like that. Like I said, it's nothing to see a biracial couple. It's nothing to see a single mom. It's nothing to see a single young mom without judgment or, or you know, just getting on with their life and people helping. It's, it's not like it used to be. And, and we can focus on when the media is telling us we're acting, how they're telling us we're acting. Or we can focus on seeing what God's design really looks like. And it looks like unity. It looks like acceptance. It looks like people who are finally seeing people for people instead of for color or preference. There was a time in this town you couldn't be gay. There was a time in this town that, you know, you got beat up. I mean, it just it wouldn't happen. And today we have a whole group that, that, that um, there, there, there's a, shoot, I can't remember the name. There's a whole, like, you know, at high school, how you have Spanish club and pet club. And a, there's a, there's a, a group for kids that are LGBTQ, you know, I forget the name of the group. I was just looking through and see which one Kevin wanted to join. But I was like, when I was in high school, they didn't get a group. <laughs> They got canceled and sent home so mom and dad would talk some sense into them is what they got. It's so different now because it's supportive. There is so much more unity than ever before, but we're not focusing on that and we're missing that. We miss God's design when we stop looking for God's divine design. And what a joy it is to know that he's working. When he's working best and when we see it is when we remember the truth. When we really just walk in to the truth. Because the scripture says all things work together for those that believe and, and serve God. The scripture says it doesn't matter what happens to you, it's going to work for your good. The problem is when it happens to us, we don't believe it. When we're broke, busted, and disgusted, when we don't have anybody to help, when we need another penny and we ain't got any hope of seeing a penny for a month, we don't believe this is going to work out to be good. We believe we're going to end up overdrawn at the bank. We believe we're going to end up owing this guy. We're going to get sued. We immediately go to Nathan is the worst <laughs> about immediately jumping to worst case scenario. The absolute worst. No. I mean, it is awful. Literally, last night, we, we were talking about the, next, the bills to come on the pay period. And he was like, so what are we paying? And I'm like, well, it's the beginning of the month. We've got to pay rent. We've got to pay this other bill. And he looks at me and goes, well, then there's not going to be any money left. And I was like, do you not know how much you make? Because that's not all the money. And he literally couldn't tell me how much our rent was. <laughs> so I was like, so you want me to fight to make you see that it's not as bad as it looks. How are you going to tell me there's no money left when you don't even know how much is going out? You don't know there's no money left. You don't even know what we're paying. Are you kidding me right now? But it's not uncommon to have people immediately see, oh, there's a substantial amount of money going out, so we're going to have nothing. Whereas God says, there may be a substantial amount of money going out, but I'm going to take care of you. If you end up with no money, you're still not going to starve. You're not going to be homeless. You're not going to be jobless. You're not. I'm going to take care of it. Maybe not the way you want me to. But I'm going to work it out for your good. I'm going to work it out so it's best. We needed a vehicle. And I knew right now we can't afford another payment. We're still juggling bids and medical bills. And I was like, we can't do another payment. We need a car. Not sure what we're going to do about that. I was looking at payments. I was looking at options. And, and you know, in that moment, you don't see God working it out for your good. Because I'm going, I'm going to have to get a loan. I'm going to have to get a payment. And I really don't want to do that. But I'm going to have to get a payment. And I was like... Well, it is what it is. We looked at the car. We decided it should, you know, that it, it looked like it should be a good one that we could get. I was like, I can get on the phone, and I'm, I'm getting ready to work to, to do the payments, and I'm thinking, God, this isn't for my good. And out of nowhere, somebody gave us the money to buy the car. No payments, just gifted the money. 
Because in the moment that I was saying, okay, payments, and maybe I can juggle this bill, or maybe I can change this, or I can cut this one in half, God's saying, I'm going to work it out for your good. You don't have a car, and you think that's terrible. You think it's horrible that you're losing your most favorite car, but I'm going to work this out for your good, because not only are you going to have a reliable vehicle, you're going to have no payments, and it's going to be a testimony that when you shut up and sit down, I will take care of you. <laughs> you of all people should know that, Joe. We've been through this. <laughs> It's a lesson he has to teach me over and over and over because we do. We jump to the worst thing. But the first thing we have to do is remember the truth. And the truth is no matter how abysmal it looks, he's got a plan and it's going to work together. We have got to change our attitudes about our circumstance. We have got to decide this is not going to be the worst thing. We have got to decide this is not going to take up all of my money. We have to decide this is not going to decide whether or not I get up in the morning. This is not going to decide whether I'm nice to my family. Some people get stressed and they're hateful to everybody. This is not going to decide that. Because God is going to work things together for my good. We remember the truth and we can begin to change our attitude. Our attitude simply is we have to choose joy in everything. And again, I'm not acting like that's, that's easy to do. It's e much easier said than done. But here's the joy of it. If you choose joy, if in your struggle, if in your strife, if in your grief, if in your diagnosis, if without a car, if without money is your problem, whatever your trial, if in that moment you say joy from here on out, I'm going to look up stupid jokes and laugh. I'm going to remember funny times. I'm going to go out to dinner with somebody I know makes me laugh or makes me feel good about myself. When we begin to choose joy and then do the things that bring us joy in that moment, are we suffering at all? If we choose joy every time, there's no trial. What makes a trial a trial is the fact we suffer. But when we choose joy, we're able to really look at what God's doing. And God's divine design is that we're happy. God's divine design is that we are full of joy and joy unspeakable. That's the plan. That's what we're supposed to have. The problem is we're not choosing joy. We're choosing victimhood. We're choosing overwhelming emotions. We're choosing to let our emotions decide our frame of mind instead of letting our frame of mind dictate our emotions. When we decide I am not going to be miserable today and then we do things to keep from being miserable, we're pretty successful. When we decide it's going to be an awesome day because I'm going to go do this and this and these are the things I love, we're pretty successful. That day's awesome. When we get up and say I just feel like crap today and it's raining and I don't feel like it becomes a pretty abysmal day because we've decided that day is going to be a junk day. We're very capable of choosing joy. And when we are choosing joy, God is working. God is doing what God does best. We don't get to see it because a lot of times we can't see what he's doing. There's so many different pieces to the puzzle that he's working out in our lives. We don't see it. And it is in the working that your fruit matures. As we grow those fruits of the Spirit, every time we, we go through a trial, every time we go through a circumstance, every time we have a spiritual breakthrough, our fruit is maturing. So every time we have a trial, every time something knocks us off of our feet or takes us by surprise and we choose joy, your fruit is maturing. You're growing. You're figuring out what it looks like to be a child of God. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. He says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. When you choose joy, it's when the trial comes, the second you choose joy, it's you saying, this isn't going to beat me. This isn't going to stop me from believing in Jesus. This ain't going to stop me from getting to heaven. This ain't going to stop God from loving me. So it's not going to stop me from being rejo rejoicing. It's not going to stop me from being happy. Because my joy doesn't come from my circumstance. My joy don't come from a bank account. My joy don't come from my health doctor report. My joy don't come from whether or not my husband loves me. That's hard. But the truth is, my joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It comes from the Spirit of God, and it comes from my relationship with Him. And when I see a trial, it means God is working. When I see something come against me, we like to go, well, when something's coming against you, then, then Satan's coming against you. Satan's trying to tempt you. We need to start saying, something's coming against me, so God is working. God's divine plan is going to be splayed out in front of me. Something's happening here, and God's going to have a testimony for me. We need to get excited and joyful when the trial hits, because something is happening, and it's a good thing because that's what God says and we have to trust him to believe that I want to share with you how James 1 2 through 4 reads in the mirror Bible um, it is a direct Greek translation so you get a lot of different verbiage out of it and every now and then I do this for y'all just because I think it's amazing so that same scripture we just read 
um, from James 1, 2 through 4, when you do a direct translation, word for word, with the right verbiage and all that kind of stuff with the Greek, it reads, temptations and contradictions come in different shapes, sizes, and intervals. Their intention is always to suck you into the energy field. However, my brothers, your joy in who you know and who you know you are leads you out triumphantly every single time. Your joy brings the victory. And then he says, here is the secret. Joy is not something you have to fake. It is the fruit of what your faith knows to be true. You know that the proof of your faith results in persuasion that remains constant, even in contradiction. Steadfastness provides you with a consistent environment. So patience prevails, improves your perfection, how entirely whole you are without any shortfall. How beautiful is that when he says your joy... It's, it's, it's in you. You don't fake joy. You don't go, well, I'm going to be happy today, even though I don't feel like it. You, you legit have it. God put it there the day he saved you. It's there. It's up to you to cultivate it. It's up to you to grow it. It's up to you to feed it. The problem is we don't feed it. <laughs> we, we succumb to the emotions, and then we don't see ourselves become mature. When we're mature, there is no shortfall. When we're mature and we're enjoying joy in its fullest and letting joy provide us with the endurance and the patience to get through the trial, when that's happening, we lack for nothing. Now, does that mean you're never going to have a car break down or you're never going to have a friend betray you or you're never going to, you're always going to have bank accounts? Well, no, that's not what that means. It means you're not going to see that as a shortfall. It means when you look at that, that's not going to be a trial. That's going to be God's working on something. That's not going to be a moment that you lost to the devil. That's not going to be a battle. That's going to be the hill you and God plant your flag on. You're not going to see it as lack when you can't make ends meet. You're going to see it as a miracle God is working out for your good because that's what he promised. And you're going to have joy unspeakable before it happens because you're going to be expecting God to be who God is. And there's no reason not to. A hundred percent of the time, God has shown up in my life and been God. I am standing here alive and well today because even before I was born, God decided to be God. And so we have to realize that no matter what the battle is, when we become mature after we let our joy kind of flow and know that God's in control, we lack nothing. Mature Christians lack nothing. And I know that's a bold statement, but we have a very bold faith. And again, it's about your perception. It's do you see God's design or are you going to give Satan a bunch of power he has no right to? What exactly is God's divine design in all of this? 2 Peter 3, 9 outlines it perfectly. He says, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. He's saying a lot of people think God should already come back. He's saying this time, Jesus has already come back and taken us all to heaven. It's taken forever for the second coming. A lot of people think this is taking a while. And, and, and Peter here is going, no, no, no. God's not slow. God's waiting so every single person can be saved. He doesn't want even one to fall. So he's giving all of the time in the world for us to figure it out. <laughs> he knows he's going to have to teach me that same lesson probably for the rest of my life. He knows me. More intimately than I know myself, he knows me. He knows you. He knows your sister. He knows your cousin that you've prayed for salvation since the day y'all started hanging out. He knows the people in your life that you want to have saved. He knows the people in your life that buck against your ministry. He knows. And he doesn't even want them to perish. He's not slow in coming back. He's not slow in revealing his plan. You know, everybody likes to quote the, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, so we don't know what he's thinking. Yes, we do. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants to save everybody. He's been, he's been saving everybody since Adam and Eve fell in the garden. We're, we're studying in the Old Testament a lot with the minor prophets in Bible study, and we're seeing over and over that regardless of them, he's been saving everybody since the beginning of time. That's his heart. And that's his design. Salvation is God's divine design. And everything is designed to see him. It's designed to know him. And it's designed to be saved by him. But here's the thing. Divine design requires real relationship. You're never going to see it if you don't know God for who he is. You're never going to be able to, to hold on to that joy and mature in that trial and that circumstance to know this is God working and be excited about it. If you don't know that he is faithful, if you don't, if you haven't had that wisdom we talked about earlier, if you don't know that his word says everything is good and I've only got good plans for you, if you don't know God loves you beyond anything, you're never going to see a trial as anything but a trial. You're never going to see your life as anything but something Satan attacks. God's design is that 
you have relationship with him. And he makes that possible through salvation. He makes that possible the second you realize he loved you while you were sinning. You know, the, the, the most, the, the cornerstone of our faith is salvation, is that God saved us. He died on the cross. He took all of that torture. He took all of that pain, all of that shame, all of the embarrassment, the exhaustion, everything that came with it. And he died on that cross before you were willing to say he was worth it. Before you knew anything about him. When you were growing up and choosing the wrong way, or maybe you went wild as an as a adult. Before you figured out that you wanted to honor him, he did all of that for you. I will be honest and tell you, if God told me I had to be beat like that and embarrassed like that for people who would not ever believe that I loved them, I would not do it. I wouldn't do it. I'd like to say I would, but I know me. I'd be like, nope. <laughs> they get to go to hell. I'm not going to do it, God. <laughs> Jesus said, I know they're not going to love me, and still, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And when we see that, that fullness of love, that we can't even begin to comprehend. Um, I think the closest we get to it is when, we're, when we become parents, when we um, are able to see us and our kids and realize that bond that God must infinitely more have for us. I think we get a glimpse maybe of his love, but I don't think we get even a partial measure of how great it is. When we realize that and we're able to grow that relationship with God, it allows us to stay focused. And when we're focused, when we're focused on the fact that God wants to use us, because here's the thing, God needs you to be a part of the divine plan because you're a part of somebody else's divine plan. The fact that I didn't have wheels one day meant I had to get a ride with somebody. And I was able to minister to them when we were together. I got wealth, whatever. I'll never think about that moment again. But I don't know if that was a moment in God's divine plan in their life that blooms into something. It may bloom into nothing. I don't know. But the thing is, if I looked at my circumstance for a month without a vehicle as Satan coming against me, that I missed that God was going to use me, and he couldn't have if I still had a car. Not saying God causes it, I'm saying God uses it, and it can be used. To stay focused, we have to not give Satan a foothold. I don't say Satan tricked me up today. Even if I think it, I won't say it out loud. I will say, Lord, you got to help me not do that again tomorrow. you got to help me not act like that again tomorrow. I have a problem with my temper. And it's not, I don't flare a lot, but when I do, it's not nice. <laughs> and so when I have moments that it comes out, I, it is a struggle. The last time it came out was like months ago. I mean, it, it's not like I do it all the time. But when I do it, I know good and well I hurt people. I know I do. And when it's over, I cry and I tell God I'm sorry and I feel like a big lump and I'm just down on myself for days because I know that is a problem with me because what I'm doing is I'm giving Satan a foot home. I'm letting Satan use my flaw, my weakness, my inability to shut my mouth, <laughs> my problems, Satan's letting me do that so that for those next days, I don't feel worthy enough to tell y'all that God loves you. For the next few days, I don't feel worthy enough to tell somebody at the food pantry, come get six bags of food. The next day, I don't feel like I'm the person I need to be to lead you guys. He's going to use that. And instead, I need to stay focused and say, okay, I made some poor choices. I said some bad things, and I shouldn't have said those things <laughs> to those people. I can apologize for that. I can reach out to them and apologize. They don't have to accept it. You know, if, if I hurt them, absolutely they don't have to. But I can reach out because I know that's the right thing to do. And I can apologize. And then I can look at God and I can say, I'm not staying there because you and me are going to work on it. I used to have a lot more occurrences of that temper. And they're few and far between now. So me and you are going to keep working on it, God. I'm going to be honest and I'm going to say I have the issue and we're going to keep working on it. And believe that we're going to. I'm going to stay focused so Satan doesn't get to distract me from the divine design God has in my life and in yours. We need relationship with God to keep the joy in the battle or in the work. We need relationship with him because if we don't know he loves us, we don't know we're saved, we don't know this grace covers a multitude of sins, we don't know God loves us beyond it, if we don't have that relationship, it's hard to be full of joy when bad stuff happens. It's hard when we do know that to be in joy when bad stuff happens. And if we don't know it, it's twice as hard. We have to have a relationship with him so that we can keep that joy. We have to grow and mature in the faith. So that when we get hit with whatever may, may fall at our feet, we know we're not lacking anything. We know we're not lacking the patience to deal with it. We're not lacking the joy to walk through it. We're not lacking the, the tools and the ability to, to work through it, to make it go away or to fix it. That we're not lacking a God that loves us and friends that support us. We have to look, be able to look at that situation through the maturity, through the growing of our faith and choosing joy to know that there's nothing we lack. And that wrapped all into one 
gives us a credible witness to truth because people are watching. And I'll be honest, there's people watching me waiting for me to fail. They're waiting for me to trip. With bated breath, they're waiting. So I know the witness to them is going to be so much greater than the witness to, you know, my strongest supporter. My strongest supporter expect, expects to see me succeed. You know, the people I support the most, I expect to see them succeed. I think they can. I believe in them. But the people that don't, that's the witness I want to be. I want to let them see, okay, you don't believe in me. You don't believe in anything I say, but you see God and the ministry that blooms. And that somehow God can say, stop being nasty. <laughs> you should support her too. <laughs> and they'll come to me and go, God said you're absolutely right and I should support you. <laughs> Your witness to the truth is dependent on you. Stop giving Satan the glory and start living in God's divine design because that is the only way you're going to embrace and enjoy salvation. That's the only way you're going to live it completely and in its fullness. Father, we are thankful for divine design. We are thankful that even when we don't see all the pieces, even when we don't see all the threads that are interwoven and intertwined, God, that you have it meticulously handled. Every detail, God, that you have a plan for our good, that you have a design that's going to iron out to be a testimony. And God, I pray that you give us the strength, God, that you renew our minds each and every day so that when the trial comes, when the battle hits, when we're tempted to say Satan's at us, but God, we look at it and say, we're excited that you're working. We're excited for the testimony that's going to come. Come, God, that we don't let Satan decide how we feel, but we let you decide how we feel. God, I pray that those fruits of the Spirit bloom and grow in us at a rapid pace. Lord, and that our lives are a testimony to your goodness and to your grace and, and be a, a beacon of salvation to those that need to come to you and know you and experience the same freedom and the same love that we have for all of these years. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.